Just last week I had a situation where I had several servers that needed to be on a single subnet. The problem is that these servers belong to different customers which shouldn't know about each other. We all have layer 2 domains in our networks, but we can't always use separation techniques like VRF. They just don't suit every design, and at other times, as in my case, regular VLANs come up short. The solution I chose was private VLANs. We can use them to separate devices while still keeping them in the same subnet and still allowing them to access the internet. I'm going to show you how private VLANs work and how they're configured. Let's start back at the beginning for a moment. Regular VLANs separate traffic at layer 2. This is like taking a switch and cutting it up into a few different switches. And although it's not a technical requirement, there is usually one subnet per VLAN. So VLANs provide traffic separation. Devices in one VLAN cannot communicate with devices in another VLAN unless we give them a little extra help. This extra help could be in the form of an external router, adding virtual interfaces on a multi-layer switch, or perhaps using some special physical cabling. We can use VLANs to separate traffic, but by their nature, any devices in the same VLAN have full rights to communicate with each other. They're basically unrestricted, and as in my case, this is not ideal. Right here we have a management network, which has a group of devices that our team needs to manage. But the devices are owned by different tenants, which should not be able to communicate. But for now, they're all on one management VLAN, which does not restrict communication. We could put them all in different VLANs, but that's a lot to manage, because it would require many different subnets. Plus, we'd have to configure a default gateway for each one. So we have three requirements. One, we want all our devices to have the same IP space. Two, we want to restrict communication between the devices. And three, we want all devices to use the same gateway. Do you think that's too much to ask? Hang around and we'll see. Private VLANs, or PVLANs, are really VLANs within VLANs. The main VLAN is called the primary VLAN. This is roughly equivalent to the regular VLAN that we're all familiar with. In most cases, the primary VLAN would logically have a subnet associated with it. In addition to the primary, we also have secondary VLANs. These are attached to the primary VLAN. Logically, anything in the secondary VLAN would be in the same subnet as the primary VLAN. They share the same IP space, so we've already met our first requirement. But because we can place devices in different secondary VLANs, we can restrict communications between the devices. So that's requirement number two, right out of the way. And to round it out, we can add a router to the primary VLAN. If we configure this correctly, we can allow devices from any secondary VLAN to communicate with it. And that's requirement number three covered. Let's see how it's done, starting with the router in the primary VLAN. By default, devices in the secondary VLANs cannot reach anything in any other VLAN, including the primary. But wait a sec, doesn't that just contradict what I just said? Shouldn't we be able to put a shared router in the primary VLAN? Yes, we can. But by default, all communications are restricted. Even two devices in the primary will be unable to communicate with each other by default. So we can fix this by changing the port type that the shared devices are connected to. The port type is a promiscuous port. And as the name suggests, devices connected to these promiscuous ports will talk to pretty much anything. We still need to give it a list of secondary VLANs that will allow it to talk to, but we'll get to that in the configuration a bit later. And even so, devices on the primary VLAN are unable to communicate with each other unless they're all configured as P ports. Now back to secondary VLANs. There are two types of secondary, the first of which is called a community VLAN. Ports configured with community VLANs are called C ports. Community VLANs are associated with the primary VLAN. You may have several devices in a community VLAN, and if you do, they will be able to communicate with each other. They are also able to communicate with promiscuous ports in the primary VLAN. However, a device in a community VLAN cannot communicate with devices in any other secondary VLAN. Traffic between devices in two different community VLANs, therefore, is blocked. This is useful if you have a few tenants with a few devices each. 
you could give each customer a community VLAN. Their devices will be able to communicate within the VLAN, but they will not be able to communicate with other tenants. The other type of secondary VLAN is the isolated VLAN. Ports belonging to an isolated VLAN are called iPorts. Isolated VLANs are different as they isolate devices completely. Even devices in the same VLAN can't communicate. Any device in an isolated VLAN can communicate only with promiscuous devices in the primary VLAN. This may be useful if you have a management network when devices in the network should not be able to see each other at all. Now it's time to put the theory aside and we'll look at some configuration. After that, we'll see how trunking works with private VLANs. We're going to work through a scenario where we have a management network on a single switch. There are two customers, or tenants, that we manage routers for. Their management interfaces are in our management network. The constraint is that the two tenants should not be able to see each other. Tenant 2, however, has two routers, and these two routers should be able to work together. There is a shared router, which is the default gateway for the management interfaces on all other routers, so all the devices should be able to reach it. We're going to approach this by using a primary VLAN and two community VLANs. That is, one community VLAN per customer. You can build this topology in the lab if you'd like to follow along. In fact, I'd recommend doing that. As a gift to our Patreon supporters, I have the lab files and a step-by-step -step guide ready to go on the website for this and two other topologies. First up, you need to be aware that PVLANs and VTP have special requirements if you want them to work together. In our case, VTP version 2 is enabled by default. For what we're doing, we'll just set it to transparent as we're not using it. We configure VLAN 100 as the primary VLAN and associate our two secondary VLANs with it. The only configuration on the secondary VLANs is to set their type. For us, that's community in both cases. The VLANs are done, so now we can configure the ports that the devices connect to. We'll start with the host port for tenant 1. This should feel fairly familiar to you. We still use the switch port mode command, just like we do when configuring access ports or trunk ports. Except this time, the mode is private VLAN host. This just means that this is a host port on a private VLAN. The only other thing to do is set an association. This associates or maps the host's VLAN, that's VLAN 110, with the primary VLAN. Tenant 2's port configuration is nearly identical. We just have a different secondary VLAN. The gateways port is a little different, but not by a lot. We still set the mode, but instead of setting a host port, we configure it as a promiscuous port. We then add it to VLAN 100 and map the two secondary VLANs. If we didn't add the secondary VLANs here, the device on this port would simply not talk to those VLANs. But that too has its uses. The gateway may need to be accessible by all devices, but imagine that we have an email server here as well, to mail reports or alerts to our customers. If we want to have the mail server accessible only to some tenants, we can change the secondary VLANs that map to its promiscuous port. Let's quickly check that the VLANs are mapped correctly. And they look good. Now it's time for a real test. On tenant one, we'll try to ping the gateway. And we can reach the gateway. If we try a ping tenant 2, it fails, which is exactly what we want. If we take a look at tenant 2, we can see that we can also ping the gateway, and as this is a community VLAN, it can ping the second tenant 2 router. And that's all you have to do to get a PVLAN topology working. But most environments aren't just a simple one switch topology. Most will have multiple switches, and this means trunking so tagged traffic can pass from one switch to another. So the question before us is, how does trunking work with private VLANs? Well, if you configure both switches to be private VLAN aware, then your task is very simple. This just uses a normal trunk. There isn't even any special configuration. Where it gets tricky is if one device is not aware of the private VLANs. What you do here will depend on your needs, 
and what's supported on your platform. Option number one is to configure a promiscuous private VLAN trunk. Assume that our private VLAN aware switch is on the right and the regular switch is on the left. When traffic from a secondary VLAN passes over the trunk, the VLAN ID in the frame is rewritten to be the primary VLAN. So from the non-PVLAN switch's perspective, traffic from a secondary VLAN looks like it's in the primary VLAN. This may be useful if you have a router rather than a switch and it's configured as router on a stick. Now for the second option. This is the isolated private VLAN trunk. I find this one a little bit tricky to explain, but I'll give it a go. This method assumes that regular VLANs on the non PVLAN switch should map to the private VLANs. When a frame arrives on the PVLAN OS switch, the VLAN ID is mapped to the appropriate primary VLAN. There are some limitations with this though. Firstly, only isolated VLANs are supported. Secondly, it's not even supported on all platforms. So check what your switches can do before you start. Overall though, I would recommend making both switches PVLAN aware if at all possible, as it is just easier. Now that you know how to use private VLANs to separate traffic, the next part is up to you. Try to practice it in the lab if you can. My gift to Patreon supporters is three downloadable private VLAN labs, which are available on networkdirection.net. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Let me know what you thought in the comments below.